Moving right along, we've passed Descartes and we've passed Newton, and now we meet another extremely important current in the philosophy of mind, often grouped together with these three signature figures, John Locke, Bishop Berkeley, and David Hume, opening the door to all sorts of jokes, as they are, in fact, an Irishman, an Englishman, and a Scotsman. They differ greatly in their approaches, but what they share is a conviction that we come to know the world through the senses, through being and acting in the world, through the having of experiences. Descartes, the rationalist, was of the opinion rather that the ideas of the mind are at some distance from the world, that there are in fact innate ideas, ideas that are built in, um, whereas the empiricist's concern has been the construction of knowledge through encounter with the world. In many respects, this is where a basic division occurs that we will meet again and again throughout this module, in which the relative roles of the brain and the body are debated. Empiricists emphasize the importance of embodiment, of being in the world, whereas Descartes is highly abstract and could almost be a disembodied intelligence, like Hal in 2001, A Space Odyssey. Furthermore, um, the concerns of the empiricists have a distinct Heraclitian flavor. You remember Heraclitus was the pre-Socratic philosopher whose concern was matters of change and becoming in the present. So just to situate ourselves here in history, just a little bit of an overview, which we'll come back to in a bit. There's Descartes at the top, at the beginning of the 17th century. Locke, Barclay and Hume are the next three lines, and you can see they come in succession, taking us up to about 1680 or so. I put in Newton there for reference, because Newton is, of course, the preeminent figure in the emergence of the modern mechanistic scientific framework. Not the only scientific framework. And I've put one more figure in there, Immanuel Kant, who we must understand as a response to the tensions between Descartes and the empiricists. So what were the empiricists concerned with? Well, here's a good example. John Locke received a letter from a guy called Molyneux. Molyneux posed a question to him, which is expressed here in rather antique language, and which I'll now express in straightforward contemporary language. He wanted to know if a person who was born blind and was suddenly magically restored to sight um, would be able to recognize something with which they were familiar before the res restoration of sight. Specifically, supposing the while blind, this person were well able to tell apart a sphere and a cube using their hands touching them. If we now magically restored sight, and provide a sphere and a cube on the table in front of them, would they be able to tell the difference? Would the knowledge obtained through the hands help in using whatever visual knowledge is? It was a philosophical question at the time, a thought experiment, if you will. Now, most thought experiments are elaborate works of fiction that do little to advance philosophical questions. This is an unusual one because it has an answer. <laughs> most thought experiments don't have answers. Um, it's a question, and the answer is no. The person would not be able to distinguish them until they had gained facility with their eyesight. This We can answer this question because it became an empirical question. It moves from the realm of speculation to the realm of um, the real world, if you like, as certain medical procedures became available, which did occasionally re produce a restoration or um, um, were able to alleviate even congenital blindness in very selected occasional people. And it turns out you've got to learn to use them eyeballs. So, but they do learn very rapidly. So this is an interesting example because it, it shows the concern of the empiricists with knowledge gained through various sensory modalities. It shows the deep philosophical underpinning of such concerns. And it shows how they um, might be enter into scientific debate. So between the empiricists with their focus on senses and experience and rationalism with its focus on reason and ideas, we get a um, 
a spectrum of concerns that never leave us. On the rationalist side, we have an emphasis on innate knowledge, that is, ideas which are sort of built in to your understanding of the world, the use of reason and deduction, the uh, desire to place knowledge on a secure and certain foundation, and the idea that when a person is born, there are certain a priori structures, some things that are given about their mind, um, that are independent of their subsequent sensory experiences. Empiricism comes in many flavours. In its most extreme form, expressed by John Locke, for example, one can regard the newborn infant as a blank slate, or in Latin, tabula rasa, on which then the senses and encounters with the world will be etched. There's an emphasis on in processes of inference and induction, the gradual acquisition and collection of knowledge through experience. And such knowledge is, of course, inherently uncertain and tentative. Having formed a view of what the world is and how it behaves, that knowledge can always be updated. And so knowledge here is a posteriori. You are born and then you learn. And these concerns are all very valid concerns. Um, we should avoid trying to present them as two competing football teams or as a debate in which one side is right or one side is wrong. But as we consider these various concerns, the dichotomy, the problems introduced by Descartes, the conjuring up of this mysterious mind or cogito, um, makes the territory extremely difficult to navigate and it makes the reconciliation of these concerns uh, very, very difficult. And with this, we come now to Immanuel Kant, who comes after Descartes and after these empiricists. Immanuel Kant was working mainly in the 18th century in Königsberg, which is now part of Russia. And he was aware of Descartes and he was aware of the empiricists. In particular, he's, he set his targets on David, uh, David Hume. Um, and he wanted to synthesize the insights of these two traditions. He saw both had very valid concerns. And he tried to come up with a view that would allow, as it were, us to understand our intellectual being as embodied beings. To do this, he wrote some terribly difficult books, such as The Critique of Pure Reason. And in there, he tried to set limits for what reason could and could not accomplish. He agreed with Descartes that reason was an essential part of human cognition. He agreed with the empiricists that we gather knowledge through the senses. And the question he set out to answer logically was, what are the bounds of reason? What can you not know? What can you not find out through reason? We won't do justice to Kant here, and his legacy is still disputed. Kant's scholarship is a very active area. Importantly, he saw that some things must be in place if you're to learn anything from experience at all. And these are things that, must, that, that you cannot learn through experience. He called them the synthetic a priori, that is, the conditioning factors of, of cognition, which um, must be in place in order for cognition to manage to be about anything at all. So he saw space and time as some of these synthetic a priori. To Kant, we don't find and discover or learn about space. We understand initially all things to be distributed in space and in time. Likewise, the relation of cause and effect, which he was taking over from Aristotle and Aristotle's notion of efficient cause, he saw as uh, something that you could never learn from observing the world, a point that David Hume had made very, very clear. Um, and so the understanding that things are, that events are caused um, and that causes produce effects and that they are in that order in time seems to Kant to be necessary before any learning takes place. Now Kant is later than Descartes and Newton, so he has a slightly more sophisticated physics and natural science and so on, but the physics and scientific worldview he has is basically Newtonian, and the idea of natural law that Newton had is continued in Kant. Furthermore, and this is 
something of a residual problem that we still grapple, Kant never assumed any kind of pluralism. That is, the sphere of explanation, our statements about what is real, must all fit together somehow in one grand overarching story. But one thing that Kant recognized was that a mechanical worldview does a very poor job of accounting for human agency. Indeed, Kant was uh, observant enough to recognize that all living beings seem to go beyond the idea of mechanism and automation. Um, they exhibit striving, they try to assert themselves, they persist through their own activity. He introduced a thoroughly modern term, self-organization, to describe the processes of life. He was way ahead of his times. And one of the motivations for his very difficult books, his critiques, was to recognize that we are embodied beings, and as such, we have no guarantee that we can understand everything. A finite being has its limits, and so we meet the world on terms that are given to us by our bodies. So, from Kant on, then we have a weird metaphysical picture beginning to, to emerge, and this is intended to replace the problematic nature of the cogito, which assumes two separate substances. But it allows us to say very little about anything at all. For the subject, the cogito of Descartes, is not something we can observe. And indeed, in Kant's Term. The world is not something we can observe. Rather, there is knowledge of the world given to a subject through the medium of what he called representations. The subject here is known as a transcendental subject. You can't find it in the world, but it must be there in order for the givens of sensory experience to make sense. A psychology, which we'll come to later, has psychology as a scientific discipline does not exist at this stage. And it has taken on this notion of a transcendental subject and worked it out uh, into a creation called a psychological subject. And this is a little bit odd because Kant himself thought that the science of psychology would be impossible, precisely because he was working within the limited Newtonian mechanistic framework and he could see that life exceeds the bounds of what can be explained there. Now, as I said, scholars still debate Kant. His legacy is complicated. It's not too important for us to know what he actually intended or what his insights are. He's very important for us, though, because he is a landmark figure after which the entire discussion is changed. And even if people pursue avenues that Kant would never have explored, he's always lurking there in the background. To some people, he seems to have provided the framework for establishing a scientific psychology, a science of mind, a science of the unobservable transcendental subject. To others, he set up a metaphysical confusion that we're still grappling with. So the transcendental subject can be thought of similarly to Descartes' cogito. It's private, unobservable, individual. In Kant's case, probably not quite as detached from the world as the cogito is, and the cogito had no access to the world, really. Um, but Kant's transcendental subject, as it were, interfaces with the world through sensory motor experience, through acting as an embodied being in the here and now. Kant didn't believe that we have access to the world as it really is, rather the world is presented to the mind through the um, structures, capacities, limitations, and framing devices of the body. Um, so mediating the relationship between subject and world were something called representations. And with this, the principal theme of cognitive science comes into being. And cognitive science has yet to develop a single orthodox direction, but since Kant, we can distinguish roughly between representational approaches and non-representational approaches. In representational approaches, we are working with the assumption that there is a something like a mind, in Kant's term, a transcendental subject, in contact with the world through the medium of representations. This still has a very strong insistence on a dualistic split in the nature of reality between, between subjects and objects. But, of course, Kant also opened up the space for disagreement 
Um, Non-representational approaches have persisted since then. They've been explored in many ways, and they continue to be explored today. And the, um, the embodied tradition in cognitive science explores this, for example, through the notion of direct perception, insisting that, no, when you see a cup, you actually see the cup. You don't see a representation of the cup. That sounds straightforward until you realize, well, that means you can't have private hidden minds. So that's going to be interesting. Um, and after Kant, quite a bit after Kant, comes the development of a philosophical tradition in Western Europe called phenomenology, which attempts, vainly it must be said, to describe experience. But it takes the idea that you are the locus of an unfolding experience um, very, very seriously. And the phenomenological tradition has always kept its distance from science because it doesn't like the way that things are pinned down there. So in non-representational approaches, we find various uh, different ways in which the relationship between subjects and objects and between minds and matter and between people and the world are laid out. So we set the stage. <laughs>